Okay, welcome to your guided reading video. Um, this is about uh, the introduction to the second sex, um, and I'm going to read this to you um, <clears throat> in the hopes that it will demonstrate um, how to read in philosophy, what to emphasize, and we'll work on vocabulary a little bit. I'll try not to editorialize too much. Okay. For a long time, I've hesitated to write a book on woman. The subject is irritating, especially to women, and it is not new. Enough ink has been spilled in the quarreling over feminism, now practically over. Um, this is funny, it's, it's 1947, uh, eight when she's writing this. Um, and perhaps we should say no more about it. It is still talked about, however, for the voluminous nonsense uttered during the last century seems to have done little to illuminate the problem. After all, is there a problem? And if so, what is it? Are there women really? Most assuredly, the theory of the eternal feminine still has its adherents who will whisper in your ear. Even in Russia, women are still women. And other erudite persons, sometimes the very same, say with a sigh, oh, woman is losing her way, woman is lost. One wonders if women still exist, if they will always exist, whether or not it's desirable that they should, what place they occupy in the world, what their place should be, what has become of woman, was asked recently in an ephemeral magazine. So basically, she's just saying here, um, you know, her whole life as a philosopher, she just kind of wanted to be a philosopher, but her gender, uh, her sex always ended up being um, an issue. And she's sort of saying, well, if that's always going to be what keeps coming up with my work, I may as well write about it and kind of do some ground clearing. What even do we mean by woman? Um, what kind of philosophy is out there about it? Um, <clears throat> and so on. But first we must ask, what is woman? Tota mulier in utero, says one. Woman is a womb. But in speaking of certain woman, women, connoisseurs declare that they are not women, although they are equipped with a uterus like the rest. All agree in recognizing the fact that females exist in the human species today, as always they make up about a half of humanity. And yet we are told that femininity is in danger. We are exhorted to be women, remain women, become women. It would appear then that every female human being is not necessarily a woman. To be so considered, she must share in that mysterious and threatened reality known as femininity. Is this attribute something secreted by the ovaries or is it a platonic essence, a product of the philosophical imagination? Is it a rustling petticoat enough to bring it, is a rustling petticoat enough to bring it down to earth? So can it be instantiated in a person's body or, or just the, the way that they dress? Is that what it means to instantiate womanhood? Although some women try zealously to incarnate this essence, it is hardly patentable. It is frequently described in vague and dazzling terms that seem to have been borrowed from the vocabulary of the seers. And indeed, in the times of St. Thomas, it was considered an essence as certainly defined as the somniferous virtue of the poppy. But conceptualism has lost ground, um, <clears throat> sort of this idea that there are these hard necessary essences like a platonic essence. She thinks it's lost some ground. The biological and the social sciences no longer admit the existence of unchanged, unchangeably fixed entities that determine given characteristics, such as those ascribed to woman, the Jew or the Negro. Science regards any characteristics as a reaction dependent in part upon a situation. This is a very, technical existential term, a situation. It means sort of an opening or an unfolding, the upsurge of consciousness, right? We are never determined through that upsurge of consciousness. If today femininity no longer exists, then it never existed. But does the word woman then have no specific content? This is stoutly affirmed by those who hold to the philosophy of the enlightenment, of rationalism, of nominalism. Women to then are merely the human beings arbitrarily designated by the word woman. Many American women, so nominalism is this idea that, um, you know, uh, we, we carve up the word in, uh, through naming practices. Rationalism would be that we carve up the world according to uh, what is logical, uh, which what's ascertainable through reason, um, and enlightenment is sort of part of all of that, or background. Um, Many American women, particularly, are prepared to think that there is no longer any place for women as such. 
If a backward individual still takes herself to be a woman, her friends advise her to be psychoanalyzed and let's get rid of this obsession. Who knows what she's talking about? She, this is such a, a narrow, obscure reference. Uh, who would be at her time saying women don't exist and if you think you are one, go get psychoanalyzed, uh, who knows? Um, in regard to a work, Modern Woman, The Lost Sex, which in other respects has its irritating features, Dorothy Parker has written, I cannot be just to books which treat women treat of woman as woman. My idea is that all of us, men as well as women, should be regarded as human beings. But nominalism is rather an adequate doctrine. So this is the idea that, well, let's just switch what it means to be a woman and switch it to being human. We'll just use a different word to describe it. But this is inadequate for her, as the anti-feminists have had no trouble in showing that women simply are not men. Um, so that valuation is reticent. We can't just change it with a word. Surely woman is, like man, a human being, but such declaration is abstract. The fact is that every concrete human being is always a singular, separate individual. To decline to accept such notions as the eternal feminine, the black soul, the Jewish character, is not to deny that Jews, Negroes, women exist today. This denial does not represent a liberation for those concerned. So this would be kind of like, um, you know, we, we might deny the eternal feminine as some kind of womanly essence, um, but that doesn't mean that we throw the, the, the baby completely out with the bathwater and say there is no such thing as a woman then. Uh, we need to figure out how this social concept gets, uh, gets used and, and, and comes into existence. And so if you just sort of deny the existence of this category, this deep category of my oppression really, uh, that that doesn't help. It would be a flight from reality. Some years ago, a well-known woman writer refused to permit her portrait to appear in a series of photographs, especially devoted to women writers. She wished to be counted among the men. But in order to gain this privilege, she made use of her husband's influence. Who knows who she's talking about, right? Um, women who assert that they are men lay claim nonetheless to masculine consideration and respect. Um, so, you know, the only analogy I can think of here is, you know, Hillary Clinton wanting to, you know, stand or fall on her own work, uh, her own history. But of course, she spent a lot of that um, climbing up and adjacent to uh, white supremacist patriarchy. And so that's kind of what Beauvoir is getting at, I think. I recall also a young Trotskyite standing on a platform at a boisterous meeting and getting ready to use her fists in spite of her evident fragility. She was denying her feminine weakness, but it was for love of a militant male whose equal she wished to be. The attitude of defiance of many American women proves that they are haunted by a sense of their femininity. In truth, go for a walk with one's eyes open is enough to demonstrate that humanity is divided into two classes of individuals whose gait, faces, body, smiles, sorry, whose clothes, faces, bodies, smiles, gates, interests, and occupations are manifestly different. Perhaps these differences are superficial. Perhaps they are destined to disappear. What is certain is that right now they do most obviously exist. So how do we make sense of a social reality that we know is, cre is created by us, but isn't just a fiction? If her functioning as a female is not enough to define woman, if we decline also to explain her through the eternal feminine, and if nevertheless we admit provisionally that women do exist, then we must face the question, what is a woman? To state the question is to me to suggest at once a preliminary answer. The fact that I ask it, it is in itself significant. A man would never get the notion of writing a book on the peculiar situation of the human male. But if I wish to define my, myself, I must first of all say, I am woman. On this truth must be based all further discussion. A man never begins by presenting himself as an individual of a certain sex. So this is the idea of, you know, uh, the kind of false neutrality that happens with oppressive situations, right? Who is the neutral? Who is the default? Who is considered, you know, not having to define yourself um, against others? But women do have to define themselves. They're kind of uh, according to Beauvoir here. Um, it goes without saying that he is a man. The terms masculine and feminine are used symmetrically only as a matter of form on legal papers. In actuality, the relationship, the relation of the two is not quite like that of two electrical poles. For man represents both the positive, both the positive and the neutral, as is indicated by the common use of man to designate human beings in general. Whereas woman represents only the negative defined by limiting criteria without reciprocity. So 
you know, this is the idea that um, gender, which here would be kind of built out of sex, um, is defined oppositionally, it's defined mutually exclusively, but there's also a valuation in that opposition whereby the male represents the neutral and the positive. So they get to not define their gender, but when they do, it's positive. It, 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 it's enabling for them. In the midst of an abstract discussion, it is vexing to hear a man say, will you think thus and so because you are a woman? But I know that my only defense is to reply, I think thus and so because it is true thereby removing my subjective self from the argument. And it would be out of the question to reply. And you think the contrary because you are a man for it is understood that the fact of being a man is no peculiarity. So the idea here is that, um, you know, in order for women to be seen as objective, they have to deny a part of themselves, which is gender. So it, it, it tells us that at the outset, there's a kind of, um, assumption of of being a kind of a, a, fa a faulty epistemic subject uh, a man is in the right in being a man it is the woman who is in the wrong it amounts to this just as for the ancients there was an app was an absolute vertical with reference to which the oblique was defined so there is an absolute human type the masculine woman has ovaries a uterus these peculiarities imprison her in her subjectivity. She's tongue in cheek here. She's talking about the norms. Circumscribe her within the limits of her own nature. It is often said that she thinks with her glands. Man superbly ignores the fact that his anatomy also has glands, such as the testicles, and that they secrete hormones. He thinks of his body as a direct and normal connection with the world, which he believes he apprehends objectively, whereas he regards the body of a woman as a hindrance, a prison, weighted down by everything peculiar to it. The female is a female by virtue of a certain lack of quality, says Aristotle. We should regard the feminine nature as afflicted with a natural defectiveness. And St. Thomas, for his part, pronounced woman to be an imperfect man, an incidental being. This is, this, this is symbolized in Genesis, where Eve is depicted as made from what Bosu has called uh, a, a supernumerary bone of Adam. Thus, humanity is male, and man defines woman, not in herself, but as relative to him. She is not regarded as an autonomous being. Michelet writes, woman, the relative being, and Benda is most positive, in his rapport in Uriel, the body of a man makes sense in itself, quite apart from that of woman, whereas the latter seems wanting and significant by itself. Man cannot think of himself without woman. She cannot think of herself without man, and she is simply what man decrees. Thus she is called the sex, by which is meant that she appears essentially to the male as a sexual being. For him, she is sex, absolute sex, no less. She is defined and differentiated with reference to man, and not he with reference to her. She is the incidental, the inessential as opposed to the essential. He is the subject, she is the absolute, she is other. Okay, let's stop there for this uh, 